Lakeside was a pleasant little town of five or six thousand inhabitants, and rather a pretty one, too, as towns go in the far west. It had church accommodations for thirty-five thousand, which is the way of the far west and the south, where everybody is religious, and where each of the Protestant sects is represented and has a plant of its own. Rank was unknown in Lakeside, unconfessed, anyway. Everybody knew everybody and his dog, and a sociable friendliness was the prevailing atmosphere. Saladin Foster was bookkeeper in the principal store, and the only high-salaried man of his profession in Lakeside. He was thirty-five years old now. He had served that store for fourteen years. He had begun in his marriage week at four hundred dollars a year, and had climbed steadily up a hundred dollars a year for four years. From that time forth his wage had remained eight hundred, a handsome figure indeed, and everybody conceded that he was worth it. His wife, Electra, was a capable helpmeet, although, like himself, a dreamer of dreams and a private dabbler in romance. The first thing she did after her marriage, child as she was, aged only nineteen, was to buy an acre of ground on the edge of the town, and pay down the cash for it, twenty-five dollars, all her fortune. Saladin had less by fifteen. She instituted a vegetable garden there, got it farmed on shares by the nearest neighbor, and made it pay her a hundred per cent. a year. Out of Saladin's first year's wage she put thirty dollars in the savings bank, sixty out of his second, a hundred out of his third, a hundred and fifty out of his fourth. His wage went to eight hundred a year then, and meantime two children had arrived and increased the expenses, but she banked two hundred a year from the salary nevertheless thenceforth. When she had been married seven years, she built and furnished a pretty and comfortable two-thousand-dollar house in the midst of her garden acre, paid half of the money down, and moved her family in. Seven years later she was out of debt and had several hundred dollars out, earning its living. Earning it by the rise in landed estate, for she had long ago bought another acre or two and sold the most of it at a profit to pleasant people who were willing to build, and would be good neighbors and furnish a general comradeship for herself and her growing family. She had an independent income, from safe investments, of about a hundred dollars a year. Her children were growing in years and grace, and she was a pleased and happy woman. Happy in her husband, happy in her children, and the husband and the children were happy in her. It is, at this point, that this history begins. The youngest girl, Clytemestra, called Clytie for short, was eleven. Her sister, Gwendolen, called Gwen for short, was thirteen. Nice girls, and comely. The names betray the latent romance tinge in the parental blood. The parents' names indicate that the tinge was an inheritance. It was an affectionate family, hence all four of its members had pet names. Saladin's was a curious and unsexing one, Sally. And so was Electra's, Alec. All day long Sally was a good and diligent bookkeeper and salesman. All day long Alec was a good and faithful mother and housewife, and thoughtful and calculating businesswoman. But in the cozy living-room at night they put the plodding world away, and lived in another and a fairer, reading romances to each other, dreaming dreams, comrading with kings and princes, and stately lords and ladies, in the flash and stir and splendor of noble palaces and grim and ancient castles. End of chapter 1 of the $30,000 Bequest This is section 2 of the $30,000 Bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Thirty Thousand Dollar Bequest by Mark Twain. Chapter Two. Now came great news, stunning news, joyous news, in fact. It came from a neighboring state where the family's only surviving relative lived. It was Sally's relative, a sort of vague and indefinite uncle or second or third cousin by the name of Tilbury Foster, seventy, and a bachelor, 
reputed well off, and correspondingly sour and crusty. Sally had tried to make up to him once, by letter, in a bygone time, and had not made that mistake again. Tilbury now wrote to Sally, saying he should shortly die, and should leave him thirty thousand dollars cash, not for love, but because money had given him most of his troubles and exasperations, and he wished to place it where there was good hope that it would continue its malignant work. The bequest would be found in his will, and would be paid over, provided that Sally should be able to prove to the executors that he had taken no notice of the gift by spoken word or by letter, had made no inquiries concerning the moribund's progress toward the everlasting tropics, and had not attended the funeral. As soon as Alec had partially recovered from the tremendous emotions created by the letter, she sent to the relative's habitat and subscribed for the local paper. Man and wife entered into a solemn compact now to never mention the great news to any one while the relative lived, lest some ignorant person carry the fact to the deathbed and distort it and make it appear that they were disobediently thankful for the bequest, and just the same as confessing it and publishing it right in the face of the prohibition. For the rest of the day Sally made havoc and confusion with his books, and Alec could not keep her mind on her affairs, not even take up a flower-pot or book or a stick of wood without forgetting what she had intended to do with it for both were dreaming. Thirty thousand dollars! All day long the music of those inspiring words sang through those people's heads. From his marriage day forth, Alec's grip had been upon the purse, and Sally had seldom known what it was to be privileged to squander a dime on non-necessities. Thirty thousand dollars! The song went on and on, a vast sum, an unthinkable sum. All day long Alec was absorbed in planning how to invest it, Sally in planning how to spend it. There was no romance reading that night. The children took themselves away early, for their parents were silent, distraught, and strangely unentertaining. The good-night kisses might as well have been impressed upon vacancy for all the response they got. The parents were not aware of the kisses, and the children had been gone an hour before their absence was noticed. Two pencils had been busy during that hour, note-making, in the way of plans. It was Sally who broke the stillness at last. He said, with exultation, "'Ah, it'll be grand, Alec! Out of the first thousand we'll have a horse and a buggy for summer, and a cutter and a skin lap-robe for winter.' Alec responded with decision and composure, "'Out of the capital? Nothing of the kind? Not if it was a million. Sally was deeply disappointed. The glow went out of his face. "'Oh, Alec,' he said reproachfully, "'we've always worked so hard and been so scrimped, and now that we are rich it does seem—' He did not finish, for he saw her eye soften. His supplication had touched her. She said, with gentle persuasiveness, "'We must not spend the capital, dear. It would not be wise. Out of the income from it—' "'That will answer. That will answer, Alec. How dear and good you are!' There will be a noble income, and if we can spend that—not all of it, dear, not all of it, but you can spend a part of it, that is, a reasonable part, but the whole of the capital, every penny of it, must be put right to work and kept at it. You see the reasonableness of that, don't you?" "'Why, yes, yes, of course. But we'll have to wait so long, six months before the first interest falls due. Yes, maybe longer longer, Alec? Why? Don't they pay half yearly? That kind of investment, yes. But I shan't invest in that way. What way, then? For big returns. Big. That's good. Go on, Alec. What is it? Coal. The new mines. Cannel. I mean to put in ten thousand. Ground floor. When we organize, we'll get three shares for one. By George, but it sounds good, Alec. Then the shares will be worth how much, and when? About a year. They'll pay ten per cent, half yearly, and be worth thirty thousand. I know all about it. The advertisement is in the Cincinnati paper here. Land! 
thirty thousand for ten in a year let's jam in the whole capital and pull out ninety i'll write and subscribe right now tomorrow it may be too late he was flying to the writing desk but aleck stopped him and put him back in his chair she said don't lose your head so we mustn't subscribe till we've got the money don't you know that sally's excitement went down a degree or two but he was not wholly appeased why aleck we'll have it you know and so soon too he's probably out of his troubles before this it's a hundred to nothing he's selecting his brimstone shovel this very minute now i think aleck shuddered and said how can you sally don't talk in that way it is perfectly scandalous oh well make it a halo if you like i don't care for his outfit i was only just talking can't you let a person talk but why should you want to talk in that dreadful way how would you like to have people talk so about you and you not cold yet not likely to be for one while i reckon if my last act was giving away money for the sake of doing somebody a harm with it but never mind about tilbury aleck let's talk about something worldly it does seem to me that that mine is the place for the whole thirty what's the objection all the eggs in one basket that's the objection all right if you say so what about the other twenty what do you mean to do with that oh, there's no hurry i'm going to look around before i do anything with it all right if your mind's made up sighed sally he was deep in thought a while then he said there'll be twenty thousand profit coming from the ten a year from now we can spend that can we aleck aleck shook her head no dear she said it won't sell high till we've had the first semi-annual dividend you can spend part of that shucks only that and a whole year to wait confound it i oh do be patient it might even be declared in three months it's quite within the possibilities oh jolly oh thanks and sally jumped up and kissed his wife in gratitude it'll be three thousand three whole thousand how much of it can we spend aleck make it liberal do dear that's a good fellow aleck was pleased so pleased that she yielded to the pressure and conceded a sum which her judgment told her was a foolish extravagance a thousand dollars sally kissed her half a dozen times and even in that way could not express all his joy and thankfulness this new access of gratitude and affection carried aleck quite beyond the bounds of prudence and before she could restrain herself she had made her darling another grant a couple of thousand out of the fifty or sixty which she meant to clear within a year out of the twenty which still remained of the bequest the happy tears sprang to sally's eyes and he said oh i want to hug you and he did it then he got his notes and sat down and began to check off for first purchase the luxuries which he should earliest wish to secure horse buggy cutter lap robe patent leathers dog plug hat church pew stem winder new teeth say aleck well ciphering away aren't you that's right have you got the twenty thousand invested yet no there's no hurry about that i must look around first and think but you are ciphering what's it about why i have to find work for the thirty thousand that comes out of the coal haven't i scott what a head i never thought of that how are you getting along where have you arrived not very far two years or three i've turned it over twice once in oil and once in wheat why aleck it's splendid how does it aggregate i think well to be on the safe side about a hundred and eighty thousand clear though it will probably be more my isn't it wonderful by gracious luck has come our way at last after all the hard sledding aleck well i'm going to cash in a whole three hundred on the missionaries what real right have we to care for expenses you couldn't do a nobler thing dear and it's just like your generous nature you unselfish boy the praise made sally poignantly happy but he was fair and just enough to say it was rightfully due to aleck rather than to himself since but for her he should never have had the money then they went up to bed and in their delirium of bliss they forgot and left the candle burning in the parlor they did not remember until they were undressed then sally was for letting it burn he said they could afford it if it was a thousand 
but Alec went down and put it out. A good job, too, for on her way back she hit on a scheme that would turn the hundred and eighty thousand into half a million before it had time to get cold. End of chapter 2 This is section 3 of the $30,000 bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The $30,000 bequest, chapter 3. The little newspaper which Alec had subscribed for was a Thursday sheet. It would make the trip of 500 miles from Tilbury's village and arrive on Saturday. Tilbury's letter had started on Friday, more than a day too late for the benefactor to die and get into that week's issue, but in plenty of time to make connection for the next output. Thus the Fosters had to wait almost a complete week to find out whether anything of a satisfactory nature had happened to him or not. It was a long, long week, and the strain was a heavy one. The pair could hardly have borne it if their minds had not had the relief of wholesome diversion. We have seen that they had that. The woman was piling up fortunes right along. The man was spending them, spending all his wife would give him a chance at, at any rate. At last the Saturday came, and the weekly Sagamore arrived. Mrs. Eversley Bennett was present. She was the Presbyterian parson's wife, and was working the Fosters for a charity. Talk now died a sudden death on the Foster side. Mrs. Bennett presently discovered that her hosts were not hearing a word she was saying, so she got up, wondering and indignant, and went away. The moment she was out of the house, Alec eagerly tore the wrapper from the paper, and her eyes and Sally's swept the columns for the death notices. Disappointment. Tilbury was not anywhere mentioned. Alec was a Christian from the cradle, and duty and the force of habit required her to go through the motions. She pulled herself together, and said with a pious two-percent trade joyousness, "'Let us be humbly thankful that he has been spared, and—' "'Damn his treacherous hide! I wish—' "'Sally, for shame!' "'I don't care,' retorted the angry man. "'It's the way you feel, and if you weren't so immorally pious you'd be honest and say so.' Alec said with wounded dignity, I do not see how you can say such unkind and unjust things. There is no such thing as immoral piety. Sally felt a pang, but tried to conceal it under a shuffling attempt to save his case by changing the form of it, as if changing the form while retaining the juice could deceive the expert he was trying to placate. He said, I didn't mean so bad as that, Alec. I didn't really mean immoral piety. I only meant... meant... Well, conventional piety, you know. Uh, shop piety. The, the, why, you know what I mean. Alec, the, well, where you put up that plated article and play it for solid, you know, without intending anything improper, but just out of trade habit, ancient policy, petrified custom, loyalty to, to, hang it, I can't find the right words, but you know what I mean, Alec, and that there isn't any harm in it. I'll try again. You see, it's this way. If a person— You have said quite enough, said Alec, coldly. Let the subject be dropped. I'm willing, fervently responded Sally, wiping the sweat from his forehead and looking the thankfulness he had no words for. Then musingly he apologized to himself. I certainly held threes, I know it, but I drew and didn't fill. That's where I'm so often weak in the game. If I had stood pat, but I didn't. I never do. I don't know enough. Confessedly defeated, he was properly tame now and subdued. Alec forgave him with her eyes. The grand interest, the supreme interest, came instantly to the front again. Nothing could keep it in the background many minutes on a stretch. The couple took up the puzzle of the absence of Tilbury's death notice. They discussed it every which way, more or less hopefully, but they had to finish where they began, and concede that the only really sane explanation of the absence of the notice must be, and without doubt was, that Tilbury was not dead. There was something sad about it, something even a little unfair, maybe, but there it was, and had to be put up with. 
they were agreed as to that. To Sally it seemed a strangely inscrutable dispensation, more inscrutable than usual, he thought. One of the most unnecessary inscrutables he could call to mind, in fact, and said so, with some feeling. But if he was hoping to draw Alec, he failed. She reserved her opinion, if she had one. She had not the habit of taking injudicious risks in any market, worldly or other. The pair must wait for next week's paper. Tilbury had evidently postponed. That was their thought and their decision. So they put the subject away and went about their affairs again with as good heart as they could. Now if they had but known it, they had been wronging Tilbury all the time. Tilbury had kept faith, kept it to the letter. He was dead. He had died to schedule. He was dead more than four days now and used to it. Entirely dead, perfectly dead, as dead as any other new person in the cemetery. Dead in abundant time to get into that week's Sagamore, too, and only shut out by an accident, an accident which could not happen to a metropolitan journal, but which happens easily to a poor little village rag like the Sagamore. On this occasion, just as the editorial page was being locked up, a gratis quart of strawberry water ice arrived from Hostetter's ladies and gents ice cream parlors, and the stickful of rather chilly regret over Tilbury's translation got crowded out to make room for the editor's frantic gratitude. On its way to the standing galley, Tilbury's notice got pied. Otherwise it would have gone into some future edition, for weekly sagamores do not waste live matter, and in their galleys live matter is immortal, unless a pie accident intervenes. But a thing that gets pied is dead, and for such there is no resurrection. Its chance of seeing print is gone, forever and ever. And so, let Tilbury like it or not, let him rave in his grave to his fill, no matter. No mention of his death would ever see the light in the weekly Sagamore. End of chapter 3 This is section 4 and chapter 4 of the $30,000 Bequest and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The $30,000 Bequest by Mark Twain. Chapter 4 Five weeks drifted tediously along. The Sagamore arrived regularly on the Saturdays, but never once contained a mention of Tilsbury Foster. Sally's patience broke down at this point, and he said resentfully, "'Damn his livers! He's immortal!' Alec gave him a very severe rebuke, and added with icy solemnity, "'How would you feel if you were suddenly cut out just after such an awful remark had escaped out of you?' Without sufficient reflection, Sally responded, "'I'd feel I was lucky I hadn't got caught with it in me!' Pride had forced him to say something, and as he could not think of any rational thing to say, he flung that out. Then he stole a base, as he called it, that is, slipped from the presence, to keep from being brayed in his wife's discussion mortar. Six months came and went. The Sagamore was still silent about Tilbury. Meantime, Sally had several times thrown out a feeler, that is, a hint that he would like to know. Alec had ignored the hints. Sally now resolved to brace up and risk a frontal attack so he squarely proposed to disguise himself and go to Tilbury's village and surreptitiously find out as to the prospects. Alec put her foot on the dangerous project with energy and decision. She said, "'What can you be thinking of? You do keep my hands full. You have to be watched all the time like a little child to keep you from walking into the fire. You'll stay right where you are.' "'Why, Alec, I could do it and not be found out. I'm certain of it.' "'Sally Foster, don't you know you would have to inquire around?' "'Of course, but what of it? Nobody would suspect who I was. "'Oh, listen to the man. Some day you've got to prove to the executors that you never inquired. What then?' He had forgotten that detail. He didn't reply. There wasn't anything to say. Alec added, "'Now then, drop that notion out of your mind, and don't ever meddle with it again. Tilbury set that trap for you.' Don't you know it's a trap? He is on the watch, and fully expecting you to blunder into it. Well, he is going to be disappointed, at least while I am on deck. Sally! Well? As long as you live, if it's a hundred years, don't you ever make an inquiry. Promise. 
all right with a sigh and reluctantly then aleck softened and said don't be impatient we are prospering we can wait there is no hurry our small dead certain income increases all the time and as to futures i have not made a mistake yet they are piling up by the thousands and tens of thousands there is not another family in the state with such prospects as ours already we are beginning to roll in eventual wealth you know that don't you yes aleck it's certainly so then be grateful for what god is doing for us and stop worrying you do not believe we could have achieved these prodigious results without his special help and guidance do you hesitatingly N no i suppose not then with feeling and admiration and yet when it comes to judiciousness in watering a stock or putting up a hand to skin wall street i don't give in that you need any outside amateur help if i do wish i oh do shut up i know you do not mean any harm or any irreverence poor boy but you can't seem to open your mouth without letting out things to make a person shudder you keep me in constant dread for you and for all of us once i had no fear of the thunder but now when i hear it i her voice broke and she began to cry and could not finish the sight of this smote sally to the heart and he took her in his arms and petted her and comforted her and promised better conduct and upbraided himself and remorsefully pleaded for forgiveness and he was in earnest and sorry for what he had done and ready for any sacrifice that could make up for it and so in privacy he thought long and deeply over the matter resolving to do what should seem best it was easy to promise reform indeed he had already promised it but would that do any real good any permanent good no it would be but temporary he knew his weakness and confessed it to himself with sorrow he could not keep the promise something surer and better must be devised and he devised it at cost of precious money which he had long been saving up shilling by shilling he put a lightning rod on the house at a subsequent time he relapsed what miracles habit can do and how quickly and how easily habits are acquired both trifling habits and habits which profoundly change us if by accident we wake at two in the morning a couple of nights in succession we have need to be uneasy for another repetition can turn the accident into a habit and a month's dallying with whiskey but we all know these commonplace facts the castle building habit the day-dreaming habit how it grows what a luxury it becomes how we fly to its enchantments at every idle moment how we revel in them steep our souls in them intoxicate ourselves with their beguiling fantasies oh yes and how soon and how easily our dream life and our material life become so intermingled and so fused together that we can't quite tell which is which any more by and by aleck subscribed for a chicago daily and for the wall street pointer with an eye single to finance she studied these as diligently all the week as she studied her bible sundays sally was lost in admiration to note with what swift and sure strides her genius and judgment developed and expanded in the forecasting and handling of the securities of both the material and spiritual markets he was proud of her nerve and daring in exploiting worldly stocks and just as proud of her conservative caution in working her spiritual deals he noted that she never lost her head in either case that with a splendid courage she often went short on worldly futures but heedfully drew the line there she was always long on the others her policy was quite sane and simple as she explained it to him what she put into earthly futures was for speculation what she put into spiritual futures was for investment she was willing to go into the one on a margin and take chances but in the case of the other margin her no margins she wanted to cash in a hundred cents per dollar's worth and have the stock transferred on the books it took but a very few months to educate alex's imagination and sally's each day's training added something to the spread and effectiveness of the two machines as a consequence alec made imaginary money much faster than at first she had dreamed of making it and sally's competency in spending the overflow of it kept pace with the strain put upon it right along in the beginning alec had given the coal speculation a twelve-month in which to materialize 
and had been loath to grant that this term might possibly be shortened by nine months but that was the feeble work the nursery work of a financial fancy that had had no teaching no experience no practice these aids soon came then that nine months vanished and the imaginary ten thousand dollar investment came marching home with three hundred per cent profit on its back it was a great day for the pair of fosters they were speechless for joy also speechless for another reason after much watching of the market aleck had lately with fear and trembling made her first flyer on a margin using the remaining twenty thousand of the bequest in this risk in her mind's eye she had seen it climb point by point always with a chance that the market would break until at last her anxieties were too great for further endurance she being new to the margin business and unhardened as yet and she gave her imaginary broker an imaginary order by imaginary telegraph to sell she said forty thousand dollars profit was enough the sale was made on the very day that the coal venture had returned with its rich freight as i have said the couple were speechless they sat dazed and blissful that night trying to realize the immense fact the overwhelming fact that they were actually worth a hundred thousand dollars in clean imaginary cash yet so it was it was the last time that ever aleck was afraid of a margin at least afraid enough to let it break her sleep and pale her cheek to the extent that this first experience in that line had done indeed it was a memorable night gradually the realization that they were rich sank securely home into the souls of the pair then they began to place the money if we could have looked out through the eyes of these dreamers we should have seen their tidy little wooden house disappear and two-story brick with a cast-iron fence in front of it take its place we should have seen a three-globed gas chandelier grow down from the parlor ceiling we should have seen the homely rag carpet turn to noble brussels a dollar and a half a yard and we should have seen the plebeian fireplace vanish away and a recherche big base burner with isinglass windows take position and spread awe around and we should have seen other things too among them the buggy the lap robe the stove-pipe hat and so on from that time forth although the daughters and the neighbors saw only the same old wooden house there it was a two-story brick to aleck and sally and not a night went by that aleck did not worry about the imaginary gas bills and get for all comfort sally's reckless retort what of it we can afford it before the couple went to bed that first night that they were rich they had decided that they must celebrate they must give a party that was the idea but how to explain it to the daughters and the neighbors they could not expose the fact that they were rich sally was willing even anxious to do it but aleck kept her head and would not allow it she said that although the money was as good as in it would be as well to wait until it was actually in on that policy she took her stand and would not budge the great secret must be kept she said kept from the daughters and everybody else the pair were puzzled they must celebrate they were determined to celebrate but since the secret must be kept what could they celebrate no birthdays were due for three months tilbury wasn't available evidently he was going to live forever what the nation could they celebrate that was sally's way of putting it and he was getting impatient too and harassed but at last he hit it just by sheer inspiration as it seemed to him and all their troubles were gone in a moment they would celebrate the discovery of america a splendid idea aleck was almost too proud of sally for words she said she never would have thought of it but sally although he was bursting with delight in the compliment and with wonder at himself tried not to let on and said it wasn't really anything anybody could have done it whereat aleck with a prideful toss of her happy head said oh certainly anybody could oh anybody hosanna dilkins for instance or maybe adelbert peanut oh dear yes well i'd like to see them try it that's all dear me says if they could think of the discovery of a forty-acre island it's more than i believe they could and as for the whole continent why sally foster you know perfectly well it would strain the livers and lights out of them and then they couldn't the dear woman she knew he had talent and if affection made her overestimate the size of it a little surely it was a sweet and gentle crime and forgivable for its source's sake 
End of chapter 4、section five and chapter five of the thirty thousand dollar bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The thirty thousand dollar bequest by Mark Twain. Chapter five. The celebration went off well. The friends were all present, both the young and the old. Among the young were Flossie and Gracie Peanut and their brother Adelbert, who was a rising young journeyman tinner. Also, Hosanna Dilkins, Jr., journeyman plasterer, just out of his apprenticeship. For many months, Adelbert and Hosanna had been showing interest in Gwendolen and Clytemestra Foster, and the parents of the girls had noticed this with private satisfaction. But they suddenly realized now that that feeling had passed. They recognized that the changed financial conditions had raised up a social bar between their daughters and the young mechanics. The daughters could now look higher, and must. Yes, must. They need marry nothing below the grade of lawyer or merchant. Papa and mamma would take care of this. There must be no misalliances. However, these thinkings and projects of theirs were private and did not show on the surface, and therefore threw no shadow upon the celebration. What showed upon the surface was a serene and lofty contentment and a dignity of carriage and gravity of deportment which compelled the admiration and likewise the wonder of the company. All noticed it. All commented upon it, but none was able to divine the secret of it. It was a marvel and a mystery. Three several persons remarked, without suspecting what clever shots they were making, it's as if they'd come into property. That was just it indeed. Most mothers would have taken hold of the matrimonial matter in the old regulation way. They would have given the girls a talking to of a solemn sort and untactful. A lecture calculated to defeat its own purpose by producing tears and secret rebellion. And the said mothers would have further damaged the business by requesting the young mechanics to discontinue their attentions. But this mother was different. She was practical. She said nothing to any of the young people concerned, nor to any one else except Sally. He listened to her and understood. Understood and admired. He said, I get the idea. Instead of finding fault with the samples on view, thus hurting feelings and obstructing trade without occasion, you merely offer a higher class of goods for the money and leave nature to take her course. It's wisdom, Alec, solid wisdom and sound as a nut. Who's your fish? Have you nominated him yet? No, she hadn't. They must look the market over, which they did. To start with, they considered and discussed Brandish, rising young lawyer, and Fulton. Rising young dentist. Sally must invite them to dinner, but not right away. There was no hurry, Alec said. Keep an eye on the pair and wait. Nothing would be lost by going slowly in so important a matter. It turned out that this was wisdom, too, for inside of three weeks Alec made a wonderful strike which swelled her imaginary hundred thousand to four hundred thousand of the same quality. She and Sally were in the clouds that evening. For the first time they introduced champagne at dinner. Not real champagne, but plenty real enough for the amount of imagination expended on it. It was Sally that did it, and Alec weakly submitted. At bottom, both were troubled and ashamed, for he was a high up son of temperance, and at funerals wore an apron which no dog could look upon and retain his reason and his opinion. And she was a WCTU, with all that that implies of boiler iron virtue and unendurable holiness. But There it was. The pride of riches was beginning its disintegrating work. They had lived to prove once more a sad truth, which had proven many times before in the world, that whereas principle is a great and noble protection against showy and degrading vanities and vices, poverty is worth six of it. More than four hundred thousand dollars to the good, they took up the matrimonial matter again. Neither the dentist nor the lawyer was mentioned. There was no occasion. They were out of the running, disqualified. They discussed the son of the pork packer and the son of the village banker. But finally, as in the previous case, they concluded to wait and think and go cautiously and sure. Luck came their way again. Alec, ever watchful, saw a great and risky chance and took a daring flyer. A time of trembling, of doubt, of awful uneasiness followed. 
for non-success meant absolute ruin and nothing short of it. Then came the result, and Alec, faint with joy, could hardly control her voice when she said, "'The suspense is over, Sally, and we are worth a cold million. Sally wept for gratitude, and said, "'Oh, Electra, jewel of women, darling of my heart, we are free at last, we roll in wealth, we need never scrimp again. It's a case for Veuve Clicquot.' And he got out a pint of spruce beer, and made sacrifice, he saying, "'Damn the expense!' and she rebuking him gently with reproachful but humid and happy eyes. They shelved the pork-packer's son and the banker's son, and sat down to consider the governor's son and the son of the congressman. End of chapter 5 This is section 6 of the $30,000 Bequest and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Thirty Thousand Dollar Bequest by Mark Twain, Chapter Six. It were a weariness to follow in detail the leaps and bounds the Foster fictitious finances took from this time forth. It was marvelous. It was dizzying. It was dazzling. Everything Alec touched turned to fairy gold and heaped itself glittering toward the firmament. Millions upon millions poured in, and still the mighty stream flowed, thundering along, still its vast volume increased. Five millions, ten millions, twenty, thirty, was there never to be an end? Two years swept by in a splendid delirium, the intoxicated fosters scarcely noticing the flight of time. They were now worth three hundred million dollars. They were in every board of directors of every prodigious combine in the country, and still, as time drifted along, the millions went on piling up, five at a time, ten at a time, as fast as they could tally them off, almost. The three hundred doubled itself, then doubled again, and yet again, and yet once more. Twenty-four hundred millions. The business was getting a little confused. It was necessary to take an account of stock and straighten it out. The Fosters knew it, they felt it, they realized that it was imperative. But they also knew that to do it properly and perfectly, the task must be carried to a finish without a break when once it was begun. A ten hours job! And where could they find ten leisure hours in a bunch? Sally was selling pins and sugar and calico all day and every day. Alec was cooking and washing dishes and sweeping and making beds all day and every day, with none to help, for the daughters were being saved up for high society. The Fosters knew there was one way to get the ten hours, and only one. Both were ashamed to name it. Each waited for the other to do it. Finally, Sally said, "'Somebody's got to give in. It's up to me. Consider that I've named it. Never mind pronouncing it aloud.' Alec colored but was grateful. Without further remark they fell, fell, and broke the Sabbath, for that was their only free ten-hour stretch. It was but another step in the downward path. Others would follow. Vast wealth has temptations which fatally and surely undermine the moral structure of persons not habituated to its possession. They pulled down the shades and broke the Sabbath. With hard and patient labor, they overhauled their holdings and listed them, and a long-drawn procession of formidable names it was, starting with the railway systems, steamer lines, standard oil, ocean cables, diluted telegraph, and all the rest, and winding up with Klondike, De Beers, Tammany Graft, and shady privileges in the post office department twenty-four hundred millions, and all safely planted in good things, gilt-edged and interest-bearing. Income, a hundred and twenty million a year. Alec fetched a long purr of soft delight, and said, "'Is it enough?' "'It is, Alec.' "'What shall we do?' "'Stand pat.' "'Retire from business?' "'That's it.' "'I am agreed. The good work is finished. We will take a long rest and enjoy the money.' good alec yes dear how much of the income can we spend the whole of it 
It seemed to her husband that a ton of chains fell from his limbs. He did not say a word. He was happy beyond the power of speech. After that, they broke the Sabbath right along as fast as they turned up. It is the first wrong steps that count. Every Sunday they put in the whole day, after morning service, on inventions, inventions of ways to spend the money. They got to continuing this delicious dissipation until past midnight, and at every seance Alec lavished millions upon great charities and religious enterprises, and Sally lavished like sums upon matters to which, at first, he gave definite names, only at first. Later the names gradually lost sharpness of outline, and eventually faded into sundries, thus becoming entirely, but safely, undescriptive. For Sally was crumbling. The placing of these millions added seriously and most uncomfortably to the family expenses, in tallow candles. For a while Alec was worried. Then after a little she ceased to worry, for the occasion of it was gone. She was pained she was grieved, she was ashamed, but she said nothing, and so became an accessory. Sally was taking candles. He was robbing the store. It is ever thus. Vast wealth, to the person unaccustomed to it, is a bane. It eats into the flesh and bone of his morals. When the Fosters were poor, they could have been trusted with untold candles. But now they—but let us not dwell upon it from candles to apples is but a step sally got to taking apples then soap then maple sugar then canned goods then crockery how easy it is to go from bad to worse when once we have started upon a downward course meantime other effects had been milestoning the course of the foster's splendid financial march the fictitious brick dwelling had given place to an imaginary granite one with a checkerboard mansard roof. In time this one disappeared, and gave place to a still grander home, and so on and so on. Mansion after mansion made of air, rose, higher, broader, finer, and each in its turn vanished away. Until now, in these latter great days, our dreamers were in fancy housed, and in a distant region, in a sumptuous vast palace, which looked out from a leafy summit upon a noble prospect of vale and river, and receding hills steeped in tinted mists, and all private, all the property of the dreamers, a palace swarming with liveried servants, and populous with guests of fame and power, hailing from all the world's capitals, foreign and domestic. This palace was far, far away toward the rising sun, immeasurably remote, astronomically remote, in Newport, Rhode Island, holy land of high society, ineffable domain of the American aristocracy. As a rule they spent a part of every Sabbath, after morning service, in this sumptuous home. The rest of it they spent in Europe, or in dawdling around in their private yacht. Six days of sordid and plodding fact-life at home on the ragged edge of lakeside and straitened means, the seventh in fairyland. Such had become their program and their habit. In their sternly restricted fact-life they remained as of old, plodding, diligent, careful, practical, economical. They stuck loyally to the little Presbyterian church, and labored faithfully in its interests, and stood by its high and tough doctrines with all their mental and spiritual energies. But in their dream life they obeyed the invitations of their fancies, whatever they might be, and howsoever the fancies might change. Alec's fancies were not very capricious, and not frequent, but Sally's scattered a good deal. Alec, in her dream life, went over to the Episcopal camp on account of its large official titles. Next she became High Church on account of the candles and shows, and next she naturally changed to Rome, where there were cardinals and more candles. But these excursions were a nothing to Sally's. His dream life was a glowing and continuous and persistent excitement, and he kept every part of it fresh and sparkling by frequent changes. The religious part along with the rest. He worked his religions hard, and changed them with his shirt. The liberal spendings of the Fosters upon their fancies began early in their prosperities, and grew in prodigality step by step with their advancing fortunes. 
In time they became truly enormous. Alec built a university or two per Sunday, also a hospital or two, also a Roten Hotel or so, also a batch of churches, now and then a cathedral, and once, with untimely and ill-chosen playfulness, Sally said, it was a cold day when she didn't ship a cargo of missionaries to persuade unreflecting Chinamen to trade off twenty-four-carat Confucianism for counterfeit Christianity. This rude and unfeeling language hurt Alec to the heart, and she went from the presence crying. That spectacle went to his own heart, and in his pain and shame he would have given worlds to have those unkind words back. She had uttered no syllable of reproach, and that cut him not one suggestion that he look at his own record, and she could have made, oh, so many, and such blistering ones. Her generous silence brought a swift revenge, for it turned his thoughts upon himself. It summoned before him a spectral procession, a moving vision of his life, as he had been leading it these past few years of limitless prosperity, and as he sat there reviewing it, his cheeks burned and his soul was steeped in humiliation. Look at her life, how fair it was, and tending ever upward, and look at his own, how frivolous, how charged with mean vanities, how selfish, how empty, how ignoble, and its trend, never upward, but downward, ever downward. He instituted comparisons between her record and his own. He had found fault with her, so he mused. He! And what could he say for himself? When she built her first church, what was he doing? Gathering other blasé multimillionaires into a poker club, defiling his own palace with it, losing hundreds of thousands to it at every sitting, and sillily vain of the admiring notoriety it made for him. When she was building her first university, what was he doing? Polluting himself with a gay and dissipated secret life in the company of other fast bloods, multi-millionaires in money and paupers in character. When she was building her first foundling asylum, what was he doing? Alas, when she was projecting her noble society for the purifying of the sex, what was he doing? Ah, what indeed! When she and the WCTU and the woman with the hatchet, moving with resistless march, were sweeping the fatal bottle from the land, what was he doing? Getting drunk three times a day. When she— builder of a hundred cathedrals, was being gratefully welcomed and blessed in papal Rome, and decorated with the golden rose which she had so honorably earned. What was he doing? Breaking the bank at Monte Carlo. He stopped. He could go no farther. He could not bear the rest. He rose up, with a great resolution upon his lips. This secret life should be revealing, and confessed. No longer would he live it clandestinely he would go and tell her all. And that is what he did. He told her all, and wept upon her bosom, wept and moaned, and begged for her forgiveness. It was a profound shock, and she staggered under the blow. But he was her own, the core of her heart, the blessing of her eyes, her all in all. She could deny him nothing, and she forgave him. She felt that he could never again be quite to her what he had been before. She knew that he could only repent and not reform. Yet all morally defaced and decayed as he was, was he not her own, her very own, the idol of her deathless worship? She said she was his serf, his slave, and she opened her yearning heart and took him in. End of chapter 6 This is section 7 of the $30,000 bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The $30,000 bequest, chapter 7. One Sunday afternoon, some time after this, they were sailing the summer seas in their dream yacht and reclining in lazy luxury under the awning of the afterdeck. There was silence, for each was busy with his own thoughts. These seasons of silence had insensibly been growing more and more frequent of late. The old nearness and cordiality were waning. Sally's terrible revelation had done its work. Alec had tried hard to drive the memory of it out of her mind, but it would not go, and the shame and bitterness of it were poisoning her gracious dream-life. 
She could see now, on Sundays, that her husband was becoming a bloated and repulsive thing. She could not close her eyes to this, and in these days she no longer looked at him, Sundays, when she could help it. But she—was she herself without blemish? Alas, she knew she was not. She was keeping a secret from him. She was acting dishonorably toward him, and many a pang it was costing her. She was breaking the compact and concealing it from him. Under strong temptations she had gone into business again. She had risked their whole fortune in a purchase of all the railway systems and coal and steel companies in the country on a margin, and she was now trembling every Sabbath hour, lest through some chance word of hers he find it out. In her misery and remorse for this treachery she could not keep her heart from going out to him in pity. She was filled with compunctions to see him lying there, drunk and content, and never suspecting, never suspecting, trusting her with a perfect and pathetic trust, and she holding over him by a thread a possible calamity of so devastating a— "'Say, Alec!' The interrupting words brought her suddenly to herself. She was grateful to have that persecuting subject from her thoughts, and she answered, with much of the old-time tenderness in her tone, "'Yes, dear.' "'Do you know, Alec, I think we are making a mistake. That is, you are. I mean, about the marriage business.' He sat up, fat and groggy and benevolent, like a bronze Buddha, and grew earnest. "'Consider, it's more than five years. You've continued the same policy from the start, with every rise always holding on for five points higher. Always, when I think we are going to have some weddings, you see a bigger thing ahead, and I undergo another disappointment. I think you are too hard to please. Some day we'll get left. First, we turned down the dentist and the lawyer. That was all right. It was sound. Next, we turned down the banker's son and the pork butcher's heir. Right again and sound. Next we turned down the congressman's son and the governor's, right as a trivet, I confess it. Next the senator's son and the son of the vice-president of the United States. Perfectly right. There is no permanency about those little distinctions. Then you went for the aristocracy, and I thought we had struck oil at last. Yes. We would make a plunge at the four hundred and pull in some ancient lineage, venerable, holy, ineffable mellow with the antiquity of a hundred and fifty years, disinfected of the ancestral odors of salt cod and pelts all of a century ago, and unsmirched by a day's work since, and then, why, then the marriages, of course. But no, along comes a pair of real aristocrats from Europe, and straightway you throw over the half-breeds. It was awfully discouraging, Alec. Since then, what a procession! You turned down the baronets for a pair of barons. You turned down the barons for a pair of viscounts. The viscounts for a pair of earls. The earls for a pair of marquises. The marquises for a brace of dukes. Now, Alec, cash in. You've played the limit. You've got a job lot of four dukes under the hammer, of four nationalities, all sound in the wind and limb and pedigree, all bankrupt and in debt up to the ears. They come high, but we can afford it. Come, Alec, don't delay any longer. Don't keep up the suspense. Take the whole layout and leave the girls to choose. Alec had been smiling blandly and contentedly all through this arraignment of her marriage policy. A pleasant light, as of triumph, with perhaps a nice surprise peeping out through it, rose in her eyes, and she said, as calmly as she could, "'Sally, what would you say to royalty?' prodigious. Poor man, it knocked him silly, and he fell over the garboard strake and barked his shin on the catheads. He was dizzy for a moment, then he gathered himself up and limped over and sat down by his wife and beamed his old-time admiration and affection upon her in floods out of his bleary eyes. "'By George!' he said fervently. "'Alec, you are great! The greatest woman in the whole earth!' I can't ever learn the whole size of you. I can't ever learn the immeasurable deeps of you. Here I've been considering myself qualified to criticize your game. I! Why, 
If I had stopped to think, I'd have known you had a lone hand up your sleeve. Now, dear heart, I'm all red-hot impatience. Tell me about it." The flattered and happy woman put her lips to his ear and whispered a princely name. It made him catch his breath. It lit his face with exultation. "'Land!' he said. "'It's a stunning catch. He's got a gambling hell, and a graveyard, and a bishop, and a cathedral, all his very own, and an all-gilt-edged five hundred percent stock, every detail of it, the tidiest little property in Europe, and that graveyard, it's the selectest in the world, none but suicides admitted. Yes, sir, and the free list suspended, too, all the time. There isn't much land in the principality, but there's enough. Eight hundred acres in the graveyard, and forty-two outside. It's a sovereignty, that's the main thing. Land's nothing. There's plenty land. Sahara's drugged with it." Alec glowed. She was profoundly happy. She said, "'Think of it, Sally. It is a family that has never married outside the royal and imperial houses of Europe. Our grandchildren will sit upon thrones.' "'True as you live, Alec, and bear scepters, too and handle them as naturally and nonchantly as I handle a yardstick. It's a grand catch, Alec. He's corralled, is he? Can't get away? You didn't take him on a margin? No, trust me for that. He's not a liability. He's an asset. So is the other one. Who is it, Alec? His Royal Highness Sigismund Siegfried Launfeld Dinkelspiel Schwarzenberg, Blutwurst, hereditary Grand Duke of Katzenjammer. "'No, you can't mean it.' "'It's as true as I'm sitting here. I give you my word,' she answered. His cup was full, and he hugged her to his heart with rapture, saying, "'How wonderful it all seems, and how beautiful! It's one of the oldest and noblest of the three hundred and sixty-four ancient German principalities, and one of the few that was allowed to retain its royal estate when Bismarck got done trimming them. I know that farm. I've been there.' It's got a rope-walk and a candle-factory and an army, standing army, infantry and cavalry, three soldiers and a horse. Alec, it's been a long wait, and full of heartbreak and hope deferred, but God knows I am happy now, happy and grateful to you, my own, who have done it all. When is it to be? Next Sunday. Good and we'll want to do these weddings up in the very regalist style that's going. It's properly due to the royal quality of the parties of the first part. Now, as I understand it, there's only one kind of marriage that is sacred to royalty, exclusive to royalty. It's the Morganatic. What do you call it that for, Sally? I don't know, but anyway, it's royal, and royal only. Then we will insist upon it. More, I will compel it. It is Morganatic marriage or none. "'That settles it,' said Sally, rubbing his hands with delight. "'And it will be the very first in America. Alec, it will make Newport sick.' Then they fell silent and drifted away upon their dream wings to the far regions of the earth to invite all the crowned heads and their families and provide gratis transportation to them. End of chapter 7 This is section 8 of the $30,000 Bequest and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The $30,000 Bequest by Mark Twain, Chapter 8 During three days the couple walked upon air, with their heads in the clouds. They were but vaguely conscious of their surroundings. They saw all things dimly, as through a veil. They were steeped in dreams. Often they did not hear when they were spoken to. They often did not understand when they heard. They answered confusedly, or at random. Sally sold molasses by weight, sugar by the yard, and furnished soap when asked for candles. And Alec put the cat in the wash and fed milk to the soiled linen. Everybody was stunned and amazed, and went about muttering, "'What can be the matter with the Fosters?' Three days. Then came events. Things had taken a happy turn, and for forty-eight hours Alec's imaginary corner had been booming. Up, up, still up. Cost point was passed. Still up, and up, and up. Five points above cost. Then ten, fifteen, twenty, 
twenty points cold profit on the vast venture now and alex imaginary brokers were shouting frantically by imaginary long distance sell sell for heaven's sake sell she broke the splendid news to sally and he too said sell sell oh don't make a blunder now you own the earth sell sell but she set her iron will and lashed it amidships and said she would hold on for five points more if she died for it it was a fatal resolve the very next day came the historic crash the record crash the devastating crash when the bottom fell out of wall street and the whole body of gilt-edged stocks dropped ninety-five points in five hours and the multimillionaire was seen begging his bread in the bowery aleck sternly held her grip and put up as long as she could but at last there came a call which she was powerless to meet and her imaginary brokers sold her out then and not till then the man in her was vanished and the woman in her resumed sway she put her arms about her husband's neck and wept saying i am to blame do not forgive me i cannot bear it we are paupers paupers and i am so miserable the weddings will never come off all that is past we could not even buy the dentist now a bitter reproach was on sally's tongue i begged you to sell but you he did not say it he had not the heart to add a hurt to that broken and repentant spirit a nobler thought came to him and he said bear up my aleck all is not lost you really never invested a penny of my uncle's bequest but only its unmaterialized future what we have lost was only the incremented harvest from that future by your incomparable financial judgment and sagacity cheer up banish these griefs we still have the thirty thousand untouched and with the experience which you have acquired think what you will be able to do with it in a couple of years the marriages are not off they are only postponed these were blessed words aleck saw how true they were and their influence was electric her tears ceased to flow and her great spirit rose to its full stature again with flashing eye and grateful heart and with hand uplifted in pledge and prophecy she said now and here i proclaim but she was interrupted by a visitor it was the editor and proprietor of the sagamore he had happened into lakeside to pay a duty call upon an obscure grandmother of his who was nearing the end of her pilgrimage and with the idea of combining business with grief he had looked up the fosters who had been so absorbed in other things for the past four years that they neglected to pay up their subscription six dollars due no visitor could have been more welcome he would know all about uncle tilbury and what his chances might be getting to be cemetery words they could of course ask no questions for that would squelch the bequest but they could nibble around on the edge of the subject and hope for results the scheme did not work the obtuse editor did not know he was being nibbled at but at last chance accomplished what art had failed in in illustration of something under discussion which required the help of metaphor the editor said land it's as tough as tilbury foster as we say it was sudden and it made the fosters jump the editor noticed and said apologetically no harm intended i assure you it's just a saying just a joke you know nothing of it relation of yours sally crowded his burning eagerness down and answered with all the indifference he could assume i well not that i know of but we've heard of him the editor was thankful and resumed his composure sally added is he is he well is he well why bless you he's in she all these five years the fosters were trembling with grief though it felt like joy sally said non-committally and tentatively ah well such is life and none can escape not even the rich are spared the editor laughed if you are including tilbury said he it don't apply he hadn't a cent the town had to bury him the fosters sat petrified for two minutes petrified and cold 
Then, white-faced and weak-voiced, Sally asked, "'Is it true? Do you know it to be true?' "'Well, I should say. I was one of the executors. He hadn't anything to leave but a wheelbarrow, and he left that to me. It hadn't any wheel, and wasn't any good. Still, it was something, and so, to square up, I scribbled off a sort of a little obituarial send-off for him. But it got crowded out.' The Fosters were not listening. Their cup was full. It could contain no more. They sat with bowed heads, dead to all things but the ache at their hearts. An hour later, still they sat there, bowed, motionless, silent, the visitor long ago gone, they unaware. Then they stirred, and lifted their heads wearily, and gazed at each other wistfully, dreamily, dazed then presently began to twaddle to each other in a wandering and childish way at intervals they lapsed into silences leaving a sentence unfinished seemingly either unaware of it or losing their way sometimes when they woke out of these silences they had a dim and transient consciousness that something had happened to their minds then with a dumb and yearning solicitude they would softly caress each other's hands in mutual compassion and support, as if they would say, I am near you, I will not forsake you, we will bear it together. Somewhere there is release and forgetfulness, somewhere there is a grave and peace. Be patient, it will not be long. They lived yet two years in mental night, always brooding, steeped in vague regrets and melancholy dreams, never speaking then release came to both on the same day toward the end the darkness lifted from sally's ruined mind for a moment and he said vast wealth acquired by sudden and unwholesome means is a snare it did us no good transient were its feverish pleasures yet for its sake we threw away our sweet and simple and happy life let others take warning by us. He lay silent a while, with closed eyes. Then as the chill of death crept upward toward his heart, and consciousness was fading from his brain, he muttered, Money had brought him misery, and he took his revenge upon us who had done him no harm. He had his desire. With base and cunning calculation, he left us, but thirty thousand, knowing we would try to increase it, and ruin our life and break our hearts. Without added expense he could have left us far above desire of increase, far above the temptation to speculate, and a kinder soul would have done it. But in him was no generous spirit, no pity, no— End of chapter 8 and end of the $30,000 bequest.